Giovanna Brambilla, she's an art historian, consultant in pedagogies of cultural heritage, member of the knowledge community of the Cultural Welfare Center of Turin. She will give a talk entitled Permanent Institutions in the Service of Society, Museums as Sites of Restorative Justice. Okay, so um, put yourself in the shoes of a crime victim and you have decided to meet the person who harmed you as a part of the restorative justice program. The meeting will be challenging, but there will be people there to help you through it. How important will the location of the meeting be? Do you have an idea of where this meeting takes place uh, in social service rooms so things can go wrong uh, and you will find places which are disused, anonymous, or multiple uses. At best, they will have the appearance of the psychologist's living room with well-maintained and with comfortable seating. And Marshall McLuhan said that the medium is a message and I believe that also the setting is a medium and so, as such is part of a message. A museum does this perfectly because the works inside it are extraordinary communication devices. And this is the core of my speech, indeed. What makes a museum a place of knowledge, works, objects, and music, songs, and memories can have an intimate and unforced vocation to solicit thoughts related to restorative justice. A museum, we all know, is a place where question arrives rather than a place that gives answers. So to this, we can add our mantra. A museum is an institution at the service of society. Did you catch that? It's the ICOM definition of a museum. So let's take a few steps back. This project does not come from nowhere. On the contrary, it has behind it seven years of progressive and methodical approach and intertwining with heritage education and restorative justice. First, to be honest, it must be acknowledged that the first step was not taken by a museum, by the mediators working with restorative justice program who asked me in 2017 if I could give a talk on how art has portrayed the issue of injustice, justice, and conflicts. So this initiated a fruitful collaboration in which art became a fundamental element in training of these people who recognized it in a valuable element capable of providing tools for training and new points of view. Second, thus a workshop in a museum at that time, uh, the Gamek in Bergamo, which I led as head of educational services, was included in the restorative justice project for the summer school. And it was an opportunity to explore exhibition, to seek out all those affinities with the themes that emerged in restorative justice meetings. The human, wounds, suffering, anger, as well as the four R of the restorative justice, which are respect, responsibilities, repair, and reintegration. Art shared with restorative justice the need to understand and the importance of knowing how to shift point of views, as well as listening. Three. The third step was the COVID. And I come here from Bergamo, a city name that sounded in 2020 like a necropolis. So summer school were closed, museums were closed, and phones were constantly ringing to tell us which of our beloved ones had died. And it was in that dreadful moments that I and the restorative justice mediator came up with the idea of planning as soon as the museum were able to reopen, circles of words to bring together those who has lost loved ones and those who, on the other hand, had to take care of for them in the healthcare facilities. It was about caring for a shattered community, for abrupted, um, for abruptly severed family ties, for mending wounds. And we chose to do it in museum precisely because of the idea that museums uh, are the foremost uh, um, institution at the service of society. And also because nothing like the reconstruction of a dialogue could metaphorically recount the return of the museum to people's lives. So 
start again, uh, start again from museum and uh, start again in museum. And at this point, uh, the path was clear and you shared understanding that art and museum are valuable resources and interlocutor for restorative justice was now solid. All that was missing was a place, a museum, but one with specific characteristics. It had to qualify as a project partner and support the importance of the idea. It had to guarantee an opening reserved for restorative justice meetings in time slots made available to the project free of charge. It had to be a warm place capable of acting as a comfortable setting and not alienating, confusing or repelling, so not dark, narrow, or with excessive beyond lighting. The place is the oratory of San Lupo and uh, it is one of the exhibition hall of the Diocesan Museum of Bergamo, which is perhaps the only museum linked to the church involved in the debate of this conference, which is similar to a theater in line with what the founder of humanistic conflict mediation, the recently deceased Jacqueline Morino, considered as an archetype of uh, her thought. We are in Greece and nowhere better to talk about Jacqueline Morino theory, quoting her words. The Greeks has a great idea of dramatizing situation and staging them as an instrument of life. Mediation is the same. It welcomes the drama and takes the suffering to another level. Healing can only happen through the care of the soul. If you don't reach the highest dimension, it is very difficult to find peace. And the parallels that Morino draw between Greek tragedy and mediation is apt. The tragic action on stage deals with the issues of love, honor, betrayal, but also with the need to recognize damage and guilt. Five, finally, it was necessary to host works of art that could open a dialogue with the people involved in the restorative justice meetings. Perhaps this is the point on which you may have the most questions, so I will try to give some examples. So, the sky, uh, of Rangi set up to cover the vault of the place, uh, teaches the eyes to change perspective, to see openings, even where there are none. And Verdi's books, uh, like the medieval scroll of Exultet, which are never definitely closed, but can always welcome new pages, a new path in our history. And the retro-lit wall by Clara Luiselli, with many windows seen from outside, each suggesting a life which is not known to us, but all these windows are characterized by a visible proximity. I would like to try an experiment with some works from the Benaki Museum to show how ancient art can also provide useful support for the restorative justice practice. Let us start with this one. And it is marble groups of hands and fragments of edixiosis from an active grave relief. And the right hand clasped is an act of dialogue for an example between rulers, but it often appears on bare relief in which a living person greets a dead relative. It unites opposites and anticipates peace. Or should we work on the marble head of Sibelio Tiki? I hope he pronounced it well. Uh, isn't the fact that she is a fragment, that time has raged with her until she has lost her sight, an element of great importance? For ancient Greek religion, Life was linked to sight and light, no eyes, no life. You need to recover your sight to start living again. Finally, I'd like to give a quick shout out to the Persian field, a truly memorable experience of how the Greeks buried the statues on the Acropolis after they have been vandalized by the Persians. What other act better tells the importance of taking care of ruins to rebuild a new vision of oneself? Six, so we have the knowledge, the convention, an expert in heritage education, a group of mediators. We have also found a museum, and the works are the right ones. So what do we lack? Training, implementation, and evaluation. The training, I gave it in person, in session divided in two parts. I framed the works from an art historical point of view, but I also explained the reason why I found them similar to the themes of restorative justice. And then, with a mirroring resonance, the baton is passed to the mediator who explains what suggestions, connections, or nuances they read in first person in the light of their experience and expertise. 
And the training was accompanied by a drafting of text on the work made available to the mediators, an indispensable material for those without any artistical or historical knowledge and background. Implementation. The restorative justice meeting took place in the Oratory of San Lupo with a very positive evaluation. And finally, the toolbox. We edited a book uh, available free and open access online that documents everything. The itinerary, the phases, the material on the artworks, the reflection of the mediators and the to-do list for replicating it in your own museums. You are invited to download it and once again, thanks to AI, it will be possible to translate it without any problems for anybody. And I am convinced that the museum should be an anthropocentric place that focuses on the relation with people. Cultural objects are not important in themselves, but they're important in the relationships they foster between people. This is what makes a museum a museum and not a repository of objects. Thanks to Co-Museum for the opportunity to speak to such a qualified audience, I did not come here to, come to put my project in the spotlight, but to plant seeds uh, and encourage the dissemination of this idea in other places, from botanical gardens to science museum, from anthropological to historical museum, which transmit our collective memory. Etsy Den Gnosizzo. I am aware that I do not know everything, just as Socrates said, there is always something to learn, but I am confident that the foundation of this project are solid and it will grow and improve over time. The path is set and I don't want to go back to the past. Efkaristo. Thank you very much, Ivana. And there's more than just depositing knowledge, it's also sharing it. And Ivana is giving a masterclass later today, so it's very important to be able to share. This is one of the aims of the Co Museum, our practices. What went wrong, what works, what doesn't work, because we're not inventing the wheel when we're really trying to make a difference in our museum. So do we have any questions? Hands. Let me see if I have. Any online questions? Well, people will be, you will be available yeah. for everybody later on, so I'm not worried about that. But let me check if there is an online question. Oh, somebody is typing. Give me one minute. Ah, Ehumela, uh, Lizzie, please. That was very uh, interesting, and thank you very much for your generosity in sharing the guidelines that you have created out of so much of your experience. I just wanted to ask how you build trust when the relationship is so crucial and very fragile when we're talking about restorative justice. Well, I'm very lucky be because it's not me. I mean, uh, I am the first part of the project, and this is uh, something with which the mediator deals. But uh, um, in Italy, but in other places as well, and lots of countries, um, in the law, you have the chance uh, to meet uh, uh, your victim, and it can be a part of restorative justice program. So uh, mediator are at the disposal of this person and it takes a lot. I mean, sometimes if you go at the TV and uh, you will see a father who had just lost uh, her daughter because she had been killed by the so-called fiancé and people say, can you forgive? It's no word. I mean, you, you can't do this question just straight away. It's take time and it's never just a matter of uh, forgiveness. It's, it's just, you know, that you want to know the reason. And mediators are very good in doing this because um, the first uh, thing that they said to me is, 
when someone is telling something, you cannot say, oh, I understand, because you can't. You can be empathic, but you can't say just, oh, I understand, I see. But they answer, I feel it. I listen it. I am grasping what you are saying. And they work as a sort of mirror, so they sort of uh, build again what has been said and give it to the victim. And so they really work in doing this. And if you choose a setting which is not uh, a social service room, but uh, a museum or a botanical garden, I mean, mm, not uh, too big, uh, but comfortable. And, uh, and you have got artworks, but even items, it can be everything uh, that can help uh, like something you grab to, because it helps you to start speaking. And so it's not misusing an artwork because uh, artwork are born to be devices of communication. They are born to communicate. So that's why some artworks could be used. Some other no, uh, because they're too difficult. Um, I hope that I answered. Yes, that's, thank you. And I have one question that kind of extends what you started saying, and it's, what other uh, professionals than museologists and mediators are involved in such projects? Health professionals or other professionals? Um, well, we, we did it. Uh, I mean, I'm an art historian and uh, I'm an expert in pedagogy of the cultural heritage, so I've got this sort of double side. And uh, mediators comes from very different fields. Some of them, because I saw some of the names of the people who registered in the master class, and some of them uh, are lawyers, some other are doctors. So it's a parallel path to a professional training one. Media. Yes, so, and the training uh, lasts uh, three or four years before starting, and they never act alone. They're always a couple during every uh, meeting of restorative justice. Mm -hmm. So do you have like, mental health workers as well, or social workers, or it's mainly? No, it's mainly mediators because uh, they they're deputy to do yeah. this. Mm -hmm. One more question, okay? So I'm playing around with you. <laughs> so, how can the implementation of restorative uh, justice contribute to the healing of trauma within communities affected by historical injustices? Well, there are plenty of literature about it. Just uh, think about Argentina or think about uh, apartheid uh, and. Uh, uh, Pretoria, lots of places has been involved. And uh, in this case, when, I mean, uh, an entire country has got this sort of civil war, and ne in, in Yugoslavia near, you have got the Balkans uh, next by, and it happens the same. People who were friends uh, killed each other and did uh, really awful things. Uh, and uh, in, in, in this case, of course, you cannot afford a trial putting people in jail. I mean, it, it could not uh, be so useful because you need uh, to build peace and to build uh, and to create uh, the condition for a country to start living again. I am really very concerned about what is happening now in Israel. I mean, I'm on the part on the side of the victim, so it's not a political stage. But uh, the, what I'm constantly thinking is that uh, hostages, as well as uh, children or relatives, uh, people who lost their beloved one, uh, which kind of thought will they have onwards? They will grow in hate uh, and anger and pain. Uh, and so maybe this could be a tool, maybe, even if it's so sad what is happening. Yeah. Indeed. I remember from last year, Catherine Babs, who presented this European program, it's worth checking online. It's called Identity on the Line. And they studied and registered three generations of trauma from, from the 20th century war in Europe, basically. It was very interesting how literally people would carry in their DNA the trauma and it was taken out after interviews in museums and discussions and exhibitions. So all this issue of healing through. I just said one very mm -hmm. short thing. Um, sometimes uh, the offender 
does not mean uh, his victims. Sometimes it happens that he accepts uh, to meet a victim of someone else who did the same uh, crime. And it works because uh, uh, you can explain the reason, you can share the feeling, and uh, it heals, even if it was not a direct, yes. We just not skip a sentence. So if we don't have any questions, and say a big thank you, Giovanna.